Hey guys, welcome. In this video I would like to show you something which is very unusual, but it happened in a top game between former world champion Magnus Carlsen and Levon Aronian on day 9 of the Global Chess League in Dubai. I don't want to reveal anything, I don't want to spoil anything, just it's going to be not too long and uh, it's going to be very interesting. So let's just dive straight into the action as Magnus opens with a move 1b3. The Larsen opening, or the Nimsovich Larsen attack, it's just how you would like to call it. It's a flank opening, why it's intending to put a bishop on b2 and doesn't want to conquer the center with its pawns yet. Just after d5, the bishop goes to d2, knight f6, knight f3, bishop g4, e3, e6. Very typical developing scheme for black, bringing out the light squared bishop and then placing the pawns on the light square. This is a good strategy. Black's position is rock solid, doesn't contain any weaknesses. White goes h3, questioning what the bishop is gonna do. And black has the option to take on f3, training off the bishop for the knight, but maintaining the tension with bishop h5 is perhaps more common. Now white goes for the move d3. And um, well, it's a, it's a flexible move. You don't really want to place your pawn on d4 because then the bishop on b2 will not be too happy at all. Black goes h6. Now you may think that's a sort of anti-developing move, but in these sort of structures, it's kind of common with the idea that after g4, white is going to play very ambitiously attacking the uh, bishop on h5, grabbing space on the king side. Bishop has to go back to g6. Now knight e5 with the idea to take on g6, and that would ruin black's pawn structure. So now we understand the idea behind that move h6 by black. The bishop can now drop back to h7. Very standard way of playing. I mean, the position itself, it's kind of unusual uh, just when you look at it from a theoretical perspective. But very often the bishop comes to h7. Sometimes it just goes directly from c8 to f5 and then to h7. But now the pawns have been forced to come forward and that can be an advantage of course, but it can also create new weaknesses. Let's have a look. White play here the move knight d2, developing the knight. And interesting moment as here Levon goes for the move knight fd7. You may think why he's moving that knight away. He can also play knight bd7. And well, if you look what happened in the game after knight fd7, knight takes d7, Knight takes d7, you have the exact position. Then it doesn't matter which knight um, re uh, which knight goes first to, uh, to d7. But there's an additional option. What I want to show you is there is this possibility to take with the queen. Interesting idea. So that after, for instance, bishop g2, now you develop your knight to c6 with the idea to play very quickly e5, maybe even f6. And then you see that white strategy may have been... Not wrong, but not uh, too great in uh, in itself because uh, black is gaining control over the center. But knight takes d7 is a very solid move. And after bishop g2, the reason black recaptures with that knight is that he wants to play for this setup with pawns on the light squares in the Slav setup. This is a very typical strategy. Queen e2, queen c7, both sides making a queen move. The reason is that white doesn't really want to castle kingside, but likely the king is going to the other side of the board. And black, in his turn, cannot really move the bishop yet because the bishop got to retain control over the pawn on g7. So white plays f4, gaining control over the e5 square, and black goes f6. Very interesting move, very typical, trying to make the bishop on b2 look less impressive. Now. Castling queenside has been played and you understand that now the king is relatively safe on the queenside and white will look for ideas to generate some play on the other wing, trying to expand with its pawns, try to create an open file and uh, well, that's typical strategy for this uh, b3 opening. Black goes queen a5, attacking the pawn on uh, a2, but look what Magnus does, he ignores the threat, he plays the move e4. So the idea is that if black would take the pawn on uh, a2, there is e takes d5. And that is um, a very unpleasant move because you cannot really recapture with your pawn as the pawn on e6 can be uh, can be taken. So that's the idea of the move e4. Blight 
is trying to open up the E file as the black king is in the center. Therefore, black decided to move the king away, uh, castling queenside. Now, of course, queen takes A2 is a serious threat, so white played king B1. And now we see that the move F6 was quite, uh, quite useful as black is about to bring out his dark squared bishop. Bishop A3 offering the exchange of, uh, of dark squared bishops. And white cannot really avoid it. I mean, white can just go away with the bishop to, uh, to A1. And uh, then the bishop stays on the board. But I think at some point black will place its bishop on B4, try to place its bishop on C3, initiate the exchange of these bishops. And later on, these dark squares, they may become vulnerable. Keep that idea in mind, because who knows, maybe we'll, we will get to see something interesting related to that. Anyway, Magnus thought, if bishops are going to be swapped, let's just take myself on uh, on a3 to get some clarity. Queen takes a3, e takes d5. Now the pawn on e6 is hanging, so black got to recapture with its uh, with its e pawn. And now, well, position is symmetrical. There's only one open file, and that's occupied by the white queen. And therefore, uh, black is about to go rook h to e8, attacking that queen. And now instead, white thinks, let's just place the rook on e1. Now, if you go rook e8, you can just take that rook and you do get uh, two uh, rooks for the queen. So rook e8 is not a serious option. What can uh, what can black do? Well, I think a very solid continuation would be to drop back with the queen to b4 to attack this pawn on, uh, on f4. And if white's going to play f5, which is, I mean, this didn't happen in the game. Queen b4 was not played. But here I think h5 is going to be played with the idea that if white takes, you take the pawn on f5. And if the tension stays there, black is going to take and then play g6. Black is looking for ways to simplify and the game will be heading towards, um, well, towards a draw most likely. But now things are getting really interesting. And that's thanks to the move played by Levon Aronian. He played here the move f5. He wanted to avoid white from uh, carrying out that pawn move to uh, make sure that the bishop will become active uh, later on. But at the moment, this bishop doesn't look great at all. And by playing this move f5, you're weakening the e5 square. So what does Magnus play here? He goes for the move knight f3, intending to jump in to that square on e5. f takes g4, h takes g4. And we do get a small imbalance with an f pawn versus an h pawn. But I think white can probably count on an edge here, depending on what black is going to do. Definitely, black's next move was imprecise, was not a great move. You're attacking uh, the pawn on f4, but white is planning to go f5 anyway. Just let's go back one second. Instead of rook h to f8, I think the move queen b4 is way more precise. As you do attack the pawn on f4, if the pawn goes forward, you can take the pawn on g4. That is the big difference with rook h2. Uh, f8. Now instead of queen b4 there, uh, sorry, after a queen b4, instead of playing f5, there are various moves, but it's difficult for white to protect the pawn. An interesting idea could be to play queen f2 to indirectly attack uh, the pawn on uh, on a7, and black has various ways to uh, to continue. But of course, black is not going to take on f4, because if queen takes a7, it seems to me that only the black king can be in, in danger. So anyway, after other moves, position looks still reasonably uh, playable for uh, for black. For instance, um, if you go rook h f eight, you uh, you can take the pawn on um, on a seven. But then at least the queen is uh, is very close. Knight e four is another interesting move with the idea to come in to um, to e six. The queen protects the pawn on f four. But now knight c five, things are getting really sharp. But now we are going too far already. Let's go back for a second because the game is probably even more interesting. Rook h to f8, now white plays f5. That's the ideal move. The bishop doesn't look uh, great. And now, if white were to play probably knight d4, followed by knight e6, you see that because of black's pawn play, there are some weaknesses in his position. He His idea was now to go knight f6, attacking the pawn on g4. And there are, once again, various ways of... Um, of, of meeting that idea. For instance, um, if you're continuing with knight e4, so the queen protects the pawn on g4, intending to go knight e6, black will play bishop g8, and things are pretty much under control. Very soon, the rook can come to the e-file as the knight also covers the e8 square. 
Instead, Magnus played here the move bishop h3, which in my opinion is not a great move, but I want to show you what white may have done instead. Knight e5 is the key move. In my opinion, by far the most natural move. Why did Magnus not play it? That's the big question. Well, first of all, if you go rook e8, trying to pin the knight on e5, white is going to play d4, and thanks to that knight on e5 and that wonderful pawn on f5, you have a massive grip on black's position. If someone is better, it's definitely white. But I think that Magnus, maybe he didn't like ideas based on the move d4, when black may consider ideas like knight e5, knight c3. But I think after the move d4, there is knight takes c6. Very, very beautiful idea. After b takes c6, you go queen e6 check. And now you cannot run away with the king because of queen takes c6, king b8, and it's checkmate. Now you see the difference. The diagonal is open, while in the game, black pawns are nicely blocking that bishop out on, uh, on g2. Just one sample line. There are a lot of other variations as well, but perhaps Magnus missed something. Instead, there followed the move bishop to, uh, to h3, and well, the bishop itself is not looking great, but Magnus has a very clear idea. He wants to push g5, eventually try to move, force black to move that knight away, and then activate his bishop along this diagonal. Black bent for principled move d4. And I think this is uh, absolutely unclear, but um, because black is about to go for something like knight to d5, knight c3, with a huge knight fork on c3, winning the queen, but it's actually almost getting pretty close to mate as well. What can white do here? Well, the move queen e5 is the only way to proceed here as, um, as white, with the idea that now knight e5 can be met by queen takes d4, and you do control the c3 square. There's no, not an immediate knight jump. But Magnus plays in a very principled way. He goes for the move g5. He is attacking the knight on f6, and black decided to take that pawn. But why not just play here the move knight d5? This looks really strong, like the knight is almost coming into, black, into white's position. If you go f6, Discover, check, the king will go into the corner. You can give another check with your queen. The king got to go away. And then you take the pawn on d4. Looks as if everything is under control. But now, the key move here for black is the move queen a5. With a massive threat to play knight c3 check with a discovered at attack on the queen as well. And apparently this is looking pretty good for, uh, for black. I can understand this was not played in the game. Uh, though, but let's have a look. H takes g5 on the board, knight takes g5, and still knight d5 can be played. But I think that is exactly what Magnus was hoping for. Levon didn't play knight d5, he played bishop g8. But why knight d5? What happens in that case? Knight c3 is the threat, but there is the move f6 with check. The king goes away, you can give another check on e5. King got to go into the corner, and then you take on d4. Now, if you play here this move, queen a5, which is the key idea with a, with a plan of knight c3, like in the other line, you can take the bishop on h7. And now after knight c3 check, you're about to win the queen. But look, there is queen takes c3. Queen takes c3, knight takes f8, rook takes f8. I'm pretty sure Magnus had been calculating all this. And it looks as if black is a queen versus a rook and bishop up, and it should be okay. I mean, if you take on g7, you take with a queen, and that's gonna be all right for, uh, for black. Likely it's gonna end in a draw. But Magnus was probably trying to set a trick here, as if this position, if it would have occurred in the game, he would have played f7 with the idea to go rook e8, check on the next move, and you're promoting your f-pawn. Know that the pawn on f7 cannot be taken because of rook e8, check. I think white was looking for it, but it didn't occur in the game. Black played instead here, the move bishop to g8. And now you gotta be careful because knight e5 is still on the agenda. Magnus played here the move bishop to g2, controlling the d5 square. So in case the knight goes there, you can just whip it off the board and everything is okay. But look what Aronian played. He played here the move rook to d5. What is this? He's putting a rook on pre. And, um, well, what is his idea? Well, he's attacking the pawn on f5. That's maybe one idea. Second idea could be a rook lift. 
to attack the pawn on a2, which is difficult to defend. I mean, white can still play a move like c4 to open up the second rank for the queen, but there's en passant, so that's not, not ideal either. And Magnus decided to take here on d5. But then, wait a second, now there is knight takes d5, right? And the knight will enter on c3, which is a devastating move. Like you are uh, about to give a check, win the queen, and it's going to be even worse. Because if the knight is on c3, the king got to go into the corner, and it's going to be queen takes a2 with, um, with, uh, with checkmate. Maybe Magnus was thinking there's knight e4. And then after knight c3, knight takes c3, d takes c3, it's going to be checkmate anyway. And there are no good checks. The, the e6 square is under control. The bishop is covering it. The e8 square is covered by the rook. I'm not sure what Magnus had been overlooking in this case. But one thing is for sure is that in this position, after taking the exchange, he just resigned. That is absolutely something almost never seen before at the, at the highest level. You, you grab the exchange, you miscalculated something and then you resign immediate, immediately after. I think very bizarre climax of this, uh, of, of this game. And just let's go back one, one second, because instead of um, taking that rook on d5, probably the best defensive attempt here would be try to get rid of that queen to be able to stop the rook a5 uh, threat. So I think queen e7 is the uh, the most solid move attacking the queen. If the queen goes away, you can just take the rook on f8. So black will be forced to swap queens. Rook takes e7. Now the rook is attacking the pawn, but solid move here is rook d7 back, offering the exchange of rooks, defending the pawn on g7. This looks pretty equalish. Anyway, it didn't happen in the game. Very remarkable end of the game, but Levon Aronion just managed to win this game in only 27 moves due to a huge blunder by the former world champion. Very instructive, a lot of tactical ideas and positional plans as well. Hope you enjoyed it and we'll be back very soon again. Bye bye.